Well, thank you for having me. Um, I uh, would like to say that literally no award can be won at this institution without a huge group of people supporting, and so I'm very blessed to be part of this great institution where I trained in residency and found such a wonderful home that I have chosen to stay here as my faculty practice. Today we're going to talk about something that might be a little bit controversial, and we are not going to talk about the politics of it. We are not going to talk about whether you believe it's good or bad politically. We're going to try to stick to the medical facts related to what we know about marijuana and vape use, specifically related to how it's impacting our youth today, and then the long-term consequences of that um, use. I have nothing to disclose uh, financially except to say that as a pediatrician, I want the youth of our, of our country to be making good choices, um, to be well informed, uh, so they can go on. When I'm getting older, I want them to be able to competently take care of me. All right, so some objectives for today. Uh, we'd like to review briefly the effects of marijuana and uh, the effect on the brain, particularly for the teenagers. A review of the timeline of this debate. So how did we get here in 2019 with what's happening in legislation and what are the historical perspectives of that? And then a brief use, uh, review again of marijuana, vaping, synthetic marijuana um, in our pediatric and teen population. And then looking at the risks and side effects of that youth that use, and then how they may manifest. So if any of you are ER physicians or community physicians that might have parents bringing their kids in by their ear, they still drag them in sometimes to our practice by their ear, or like test them for this or that, what does that look like? Okay, first quiz of the day, so it's early, so we want to make sure you guys are awake. Hopefully you got some coffee or juice or something out there to get yourself going. Is this true or false? Modern marijuana is genetically modified to be more potent. True, this is true, actually six to 15 times higher. So a marijuana joint smoked in the 70s had about 10 milligrams of THC in it. Today, looking at 60 to 150 milligrams of THC per joint. So it's a quite a difference in the amount of active chemical in every single one of the marijuana joints kids are smoking. So this is true. So it is true that there are different species and subtypes. We're going to focus on the two main types, the sattvia and the indica. So these are the two that are primarily the types used in marijuana that's on the market today. Um, and in varying levels, these two will create either and that alert and energetic high we see with a sattvia, or a relaxed and lethargic high like you think about people often using. Some names you might hear, slang terms, as you see other people out in the community talking about it. You may see it on social media. You may um, see it in the news. So you might see words like hashish or hash oil. So, or you might see um, cincinella. So cincinella uh, mila is actually the female plant who is bred to not flower, therefore increasing the potency of the plant itself. Um, and kids can ingest this in many ways. So they can smoke it, that's the traditional way we think about it, and all the risks that go along with smoking, the ingestion of inhalants into the pulmonary system, so all of those additional risks. Of course, you can ingest it. So there's edibles, you hear about that, and, you know, brownies and other ways you might eat your marijuana. Um, there's dabbing, so this way is particularly more concerning for us because it is really potent, and by heating this oil and inhaling the uh, oil, they can actually take a hit that is actually two to three joints worth of marijuana or the THC component in one dab. So in a very short period of time, where it might take them minutes to kind of slowly puff on a joint and get that, that six to 15% higher, in this way they can actually within five minutes or so get the entire amount of THC in one dab. So that's quite disturbing for us as far as thinking about the radical effects of how quickly that hits their system and how they might present. And then vaping, which is the new rage, e-cigarettes. You guys probably, if you listen to any radio, you'll hear about the you know, e-cigarette um, commercials that are going on. Juul is a big one. I'm, I have no personal offense to them. I don't own any stock or anything like that. Um, but you'll see they keep saying in their marketing, this is only if you already are try you're smoking and you're con you know, trying to you know, not smoke and so switch to our product instead. But you'll see that actually in marketing, uh, that teens are being marketed and the highest use is actually in our teenagers. So there's different concentrates on the market like we talked about. So you can have anything from keef to water hash, oils, different types. 
Some of this yellow stuff is called shatter, and so they take the oil and they press it between parchment paper and create this really actually kind of pretty looking substance. I'd like to say it looks more like honey, but in fact, it's quite high <laughs> concentration, 60 to 90 percent concentration of THC. And then that shatter is broken apart and then can be um, heated and then dabbed and that oil inhaled, and so releasing all of the chemical really rapidly into the system of these patients. So you might see them talking about different ways, the water hash being used in bongs or other types of water forms. So it's really important to kind of know that there are variant ways kids are using, because they'll present different ways, uh, but they also may have different slang terms, be talking about it in different ways. So just be aware of what's actually out there on the market. So there is quite a long and historical complex situation, both from ancient culture and actually also in the US, which we're going to focus a little bit more on. But way back into 2700 BCE, BC, we see that China has some records of the use of marijuana um, as a medicinal uh, qualities. Um, and we fast forward into the Greek culture, where we see that some of the Greek physicians talked in their writings about the use of marijuana and its medical components. Uh, for their patients with pain. In the French physicians in the 1500s as well, documenting in their literature. And then moving into the New England Journal. So in the New England dispensary in 1764, marijuana was actually listed as a medicinal property, a medicinal plant. Um, and of course, at that time, they knew that it was for primarily pain, um, that they used it for, and relaxation for anxiety. In uh, 1915, so we jump forward a few hundred years, we see that the U.S. starts to um, prohibit non-medicinal use. Um, first in California, always loving to lead the way here in sunny California, um, and moving through several other states. And it'll be interesting to see why that happened. So why do we think that happened? Do you think that's because we thought uh, marijuana is actually bad for us and we're going to be more careful and more thoughtful about it? Is that why we did it? No, it was actually big business. So in fact, what was happening is that um, we started to see that the hemp, which is the cord, the stalk, was being, uh, is able to grow quickly, much quicker than trees. But yet, so it was rapidly able to turn over. And that hemp product was being used to create sustainable paper sources, which actually put the lumber industry and the newspaper industry at jeopardy. So big dollars and William Hearst with his newspaper industry decided that he would start lobbying behind the scenes with people in the government to say that if we can make marijuana illegal, well then people can't grow it, well then hemp isn't available and now my paper industry and my newspaper industries are not at jeopardy. And so as a result, in 1937, U.S. Congress actually passed the Marijuana Tax Act on criminalizing marijuana. And, um, as part of that testimony um, came from William Hurst and his lobbyists. So then we removed it from the US pharmacopoeia, and medical use was no longer recognized. And it took another 40 years before a synthetic uh, from the FDA was approved for cancer patients. So just understanding like where, where we're at historically. Today, we actually have 10 states plus uh, District of Columbia where um, recreational use is al allowed and in 33 states plus the District of Columbia where recreational use is allowed. I gave a, s a lecture about marijuana use about two years ago. The numbers at that time were 4 and 23. So in less than two years you can see the drastic increase in the number of states who are legalizing and increasing uh, the amount of availability of marijuana to our teenagers. And don't be fooled, just because we're saying you must be 21 to go buy it at one of these places does not mean it is not more easily getting into the hands of our children because it is around. It is definitely doing that. So remember that it actually remains illegal at the federal level. So if you're keeping up with the news, Hawaii just last Friday failed to take to vote um, the, their version of allowing marijuana uh, to be legal in their state. So still a lot of states um, happening. So why do I care as a pediatrician? Well, I care because in our growing brain, now I have an 18-year-old and a 22-year-old. They would probably not be happy if I told you their brains are still developing. But it's true. 
<laughs> okay, we know that our brains are still developing through our early 20s and actually what we impact into our brain during that, those critical times is really, really important. It's not just until we're three, it's not just until we're school age, it's not until we become a legal adult at 18 that our brain says, okay, I'm done, I've, I've settled myself, I'm really responsible, I'm ready to take on the world, right? Everything that impacts their brain through that time changes the way they're viewing things. And particularly for adolescents, we know that their sensation of pleasure seeking is heightened. So activities that cause them to be more ramped up, more excited, joy rides and drug use and sexual encounters, these are the things that spin them. And we have to be really, really thoughtful as a society and as parents about how we're approaching this. So in our brain, we have cannabinoid 1 receptors. And these receptors are primarily in our hippocampus, cortex, cerebellum, basal ganglium, and our stratum, which is responsible for pleasure seeking. And normally, we have this really delicate balance. And so these natural endocannabinoids that we have interact with cannabinoid receptors and then allow those areas of our brain to appropriately regulate dopamine, serotonin, norepi, and GABA. But what happens when we take synthetic THC impacting the cannabinoid receptors, binding actually more tightly to these receptors than our natural endocannabinoids. Well, what happens is that we then have a dysregulation of these neuroendocrine um, hormones that we should have, and we have impacts in those regions affected by that brain. So short-term memory, coordination, which obviously for those of you still worried about the 16-year-olds just learning to drive, well, just learning to drive and high not so good, right? Coordination issues, learning, problem solving. There's actually a study done at UC San Diego where they uh, had a whole bunch of college kids get high, study for a test, then half of them got high to the same level of high and took the test. The other half didn't use and took the test. And those people that were high remembered the data that they learned while they were high but didn't remember the data if they were now sober when they were taking the test. So we know that how we lay down memory, at what state our brain is when we lay down that memory, is impacted. So this is really important for our teenagers who don't do these things very well anyways. And a big chunk of their life is memory, right? Learning. They're supposed to be laying down memory. And here we are impacting their brain's ability to do that. So we know, though, it'd be, I'd be remiss to say that there's no positive effects of marijuana use. Um, or THC and cannabinoid use, um, as opposed to true marijuana. Um, because if we don't talk about the positives, what we definitely do is turn our teenagers away, right? We can't lecture or preach at them. We have to come aside, along aside them and say, okay, let's talk about the pluses and the minuses. And let's see where's the balance, what makes sense. And is it, do these pluses really outweigh the negatives for you at this point in your life? Are you suffering from a really severe seizure disorder that is uncontrolled? Or are you in hospice and maybe this chemical is really good for you? Or are you just a healthy teenager who needs to go to school and learn, right? So it's important for us to talk about those things um, in order to have them come alongside and try to make good decisions. Because if, if they feel like they're a part of the decision, they're much more likely to actually comply versus if you just lecture at them, guaranteed. I don't know how many of you still have teenagers in your home, but it's like, don't hear you, right? So we know that in the medical uses, some of the things we're looking for is like pain control, um, nausea control, appetite control, and those are real, right? So we definitely know that there are true medicinal effects of the cannabinoids, but not marijuana. Marijuana in and of itself, the whole plant, is not medicinal, and we should stop talking about it that way because that's not true. There's actually over 180 chemicals in the marijuana plant, 60 of which are actually unique to the marijuana plant, and they're not all medicinal. And like we talked about, if you're just smoking the weed, you actually are doing all of the inhalant damage, all those extra chemicals into your pulmonary system, creating all some of the same challenges you're having as if you were smoking tobacco. So what we want to do is actually try to get the chemicals that can have medicinal benefits. We want to regulate those. We want to study them. We want to get healthy, safe, concentrates on the market so that you as physicians, whether you are internal medicine, pediatrics with really chronic kids, or other geriatric medicine, cancer, onc, you can use these appropriately. But because it's still a class one med at the federal level, actually that significantly impacted our ability to do any of that research. So because of that tax law, way back then, this is a schedule one drug. 
So I don't know how many of you are still prescribing meds, but prescribing even Schedule two drugs, you have to go up through 50 hoops, get a special code, do this other thing, right? So marijuana is a Schedule two drug. Opioids are a Schedule, I mean a Schedule one. Opioids are a Schedule two drug. Heroin is a Schedule one drug. So what we're saying at the federal level is that marijuana and heroin are really, really horrible. Opiates are eh, somewhat horrible, but we can look at the opiate crisis and think that we actually have not quite true, right? So the two main active ingredients we want to focus on are THC and the cannabidiol, ah, cannabidiol, well, I should have had more coffee, uh, which is the non-psychoactive component, whereas THC is going to give them that euphoric high, the psychoactive, the CBDU is going to give them the non-psychoactive. Oh, sorry, other way. So we definitely know some of those therapeutic potentials we talked about, and those are true. We can find those. But what about children? So let's look at first at our AAP policy. So AAP is our American Academy of Pediatrics, um, an invested interest in the health and well-being of our children. And the current AAP guideline is that we oppose medical marijuana outside regulatory process of US drug because we recognize that there's not been enough study. There's not been enough careful um, research done on this uh, drug and what its impacts are. We do recognize that there are some children who might benefit, who have life-threatening diseases. Um, we do know that there are some significant um, epilepsy syndromes which have been shown in more recent literature to be um, responsive when other uh, meds have failed. But globally, we know that there's not been enough done. We know that right now, purity, dosage, side effects, what concentration you're actually getting by not being regulated is, is really crazy. We have families going out there and buying things at dispensaries and trying to give it to their children who have chronic disease, and there's really no proof that what they're getting is what they think they're getting and that they're not giving their children chemicals in other ways, and that's very scary for us because we actually don't know what's happening. We do recommend that we move it to a Schedule two so that more research can be done. So that's going to take a lot of effort at the national, federal level for that to happen. We oppose legalization of marijuana because of the potential harm to children and adolescents. We uh, do support studying the laws that have happened recently and what is impacting this. So we're looking at states like Colorado and the increased rate of dropouts in the high school, the increased rate of detentions in the high schools after marijuana became recreationally legal. Now California recreation is illegal. What's going to happen in the next five years with our students in California? Are we going to see similar changes in our children? Right? If they're not getting just that, even that first step of their um, education at high school, how are they going to move on to that next level and become gainfully employed in the future? So our concern is based on the evidence statement of what happened with big tobacco. And so really, at this point, AAP is just really recommending us to take a big pause to backtrack and to try and do a better job of actually doing medical evidence-based medicine. Um, we do want to say that there is some good research already out there, a lot in rat models, and I know that's really hard for us to think about. In pediatrics, there's very few children's models, right? You don't, you don't, I probably don't say, sure, take my kid, control them, give them this random drug or this other random drug and see what happens. So a lot of what we do in pediatrics is extrapolated out of adult trials, and we try to learn from also animal models. And what we have seen, particularly in rats who actually have a really early adolescence, they have very clear phases. And so we know that actually exposure both in utero and during adolescence in rats has been shown to impact their future ability for learning tasks, actually anxiety states, willingness to eat. So there are actually some really good data um, in the rat models. But even more so just recently, just in 2019, a really good study came out looking at in utero exposure. So as we are seeing more and more women coming in THC positive um, to the maternity ward because they're using this for anti-nausea when they feel like nothing else has worked or they just perceive it to not be dangerous. Many women who say, well, I'm not smoking. It must be because I'm getting it from my partner who's smoking. But if you're sitting next to the same person smoking or in the same car, guess what? You and your baby are smoking too. And so we're seeing a high, much higher rate of THC positivity in our women. And that has been shown in a, um, now in a uh, nice retrospective review that it increases our NICU risk, it increases our preterm delivery, and it increases our low birth weight. 82% greater risk of being low birth weight if your mother used marijuana 
during her pregnancy. And what the effect is of that, what the, we're not 100% sure yet, right? We definitely need more studies. What does this mean? Are these kids' brains not getting the right oxygen during, you know, during their pregnancy? Are they not getting good nutrition to grow right? What's happening? And I think there'll be some time before we're 100% sure of all of the impact. Um, we definitely have been, had enough data nationally to show that children who were exposed either prenatally or early in life are having gaps in their education, more challenges with learning tasks, harder time staying on task in the classroom. So this is not helping our children learn. As well, um, though, interestingly, but you might think this is counterintuitive, but it's actually not. We are actually supporting the decriminalization of marijuana um, for minors, and that is because we know that early criminalization, putting them in jail, having federal records related to marijuana use only also impacts their future life. Getting a job, getting into college, going into the military, if you have a record, is a very different thing. Um, and so we recognize that while we don't want our teens using, we would prefer to decriminalize it for our kids. And actually in California, we saw that we decriminalized it in 2011, and you can see that teen arrests, actually overuse, uh, overdose deaths, drug arrests, and school dropout rates actually all decreased after the decriminalization of marijuana in California. Right now on the market, there are three U.S. approved, um, FDA approved medical cannabinoids. There's drobanol, which is our first one, uh, nabilone, and now the newest on the market just out last year is um, Epidolux. Now, we looked at this for one of our really chronic seizure patients who has been through probably five or six multi-pharmacy trials of different um, anti-epileptic regimens to control this per child seizures, but the cost is astronomical. Still looking at something like eighteen dollars to $24,000 a year. Um, so still, even though it's FDA approved, um, not on very many formularies, and um, still have a lot of research to do. Uh, there is Sativex in Canada and in the EU, not yet here in the U.S. So many of you may know that there's something called Monitoring the Future. Um, it's done by NIH, and it's done every um, couple years, and we just had the 2018 data released in December, and what did that show us? Well, the good news is that binge drinking is down. That's awesome. Uh, actually, use of opioids and um, heroin in our teenage population is down, which is good news. Smoking traditional cigarettes is also down, which is good news. Bad news is that a drastic rise in both vaping and in marijuana use um, is, is what we're seeing. And so that's a pretty significant thing. So here's a picture of some teenagers. They may look familiar to you. Um, we have 5.8% of our 12th graders using daily, every single day. In that study. This study queries over 45,000 eighth graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders across all the states in both public and private institutions. So don't think that your private school kids are um, safe from this. This is happening in all venues. And sadly, almost 1% of eighth graders are using every single day. Eighth graders. That's crazy to us, right? And we know that 22%, almost a quarter of all 12th graders, will report use within the last month. That's really high numbers, right, of marijuana use. Because they don't perceive it to be dangerous, because it's legal, everybody's doing it, it's cool, right? And that's what they're all about right now. And that's really, really putting our youth at risk. As well, we can see these staggering numbers for um, vape using. 12th graders, 37.3% have used vaping in the last year, and almost 18% of our 8th graders have vaped in the last year. If you want to know what an 8th grader looks like, that's what an 8th grader looks like. Think about that kid with a vape in their mouth, that kid with a bong in their mouth, that kid with a joint in their mouth. Think about that kid then trying to ride their bike to school, across the intersection, not get hit by a car, go learn calculus, I mean algebra, and try to like make the next phase of life. That, that's a challenge. These kids' brains are not ready for these substances. So true or false, marijuana is legal so it must be safe. Our kids think true, but we think false, false, right? So we know that there's all these uh, harmful effects, particularly in the youth. 
um, increasing their risk of uh, having problems with their short-term and long-term memory, motor coordination, driving skills, altering their judgment. People will start to argue, well, marijuana is a gateway drug. Others talk about a secondary method of just people who have addictive personalities, and that increases the risk if you know, you're using marijuana for any other addictive type personality disorders. Um, but we know that these children then are at increasing the risk for doing other secondary behaviors that are dangerous, jumping off the roof into the swimming pool, swimming in lakes at night, driving with friends who are intoxicated, having sexual inter um, interactions with kids that are inappropriate. Um, they also, at high doses, though, start to reach, instead of that calm, like, I'm cool, I feel really calm and good, I'm mad at my mom, the world's horrible, everyone's against me, I'm just going to use, and that's the only way I can not be stressed. And then they overuse, and what they get is paranoia and psychosis, and they present crazy, and they do active um, problems that create uh, ER visits for other ways, in other ways. We also know that the long-term risk is that if you use an adolescent related to the way your brain chemicals think and interact, you are much more likely to become addicted than if you use starting as an adult. That is just neurochemically true, okay? So if you want to use as an adult because of your medical problem, I, we're not discussing that. We're saying that's probably right, and we got to figure out how to do that safer still for you. But in kids, we know for sure that if you start using in your teenage years, you're much more likely to become addicted. We has uh, altered brain development, poor edu educational outcomes like we talked about, and actually lower IQ. There's a study coming out of New Zealand that shows that chronic users over time lost eight IQ points um, between the time that they were in high school into their young 30s. They studied a, a large group of people longitudinally. What about one-time use? Because there was like, oh, I you know, everyone tries it once, like my mom tried it once, my grandma tried it once at Woodstock or whatever, right? Or things like that. Like, okay, first of all, like we talked about, much less potent. Secondly, what do we know about one-time or two-time use in kids? Well, this study just came out in January of this year in the Journal of Neuroscience that showed gray-white matter differences in the brain regions that have cannabinoid receptors for children who only are using reported one or two-time use. What the impact of that is, we're not still 100% sure, right? We need to know, does that make a difference? Like, wh what is that going to mean in the future? So I still think the data is early, but don't be fooled to think that even a little bit of use is safe because we're seeing that there are uh, impacts to the brain. We know that this study came out just in JAMA Psychiatry in February of this year. That There's a meta-analysis. They looked at over 23,000 individuals, and the Correcting for all other factors, the use of marijuana increased the risk of depression and suicide attempts in this um, population. And this was 18 to 35 year olds that they were studying. So this is our young population. This is the kids that they're struggling right now, right? There's a lot of pressure out there in social media for our youth. There's a lot of kids who are home alone or single parents getting bullied. There's so much already on the plates of our youth. Let's try to take this risk off of their plate. Here's another question, fact or fiction. People think that synthetic marijuana is just regular marijuana made synthetically instead of grown. Is that true? No, that is false. That's right, that is false. So synthetic marijuana is not your grandma's marijuana, okay? This is marketed this way specifically because if kids think marijuana is is okay and is safe, they'll think synthetic marijuana, that's the same thing, it's just synthetic, no big deal, right? I mean, we live in a synthetic world, so they're okay with that. And these things are marketed and be, you know, to be bought at like drug, I mean, at um, gas stations and all sorts of crazy places, and they're marketed with these funky names, Spice, Scooby Snacks, I mean, like Scooby Snacks, you're gonna tell me you're not marketing to children and you're calling it Scooby Snacks? Do you, do you guys know what Snooby Snacks are, right? Scooby Snacks? Like Scooby-Doo, like the cartoon? No? Okay. Yes, yeah. Bizarro train wreck. Everyone loves a good train wreck. Bliss, Black Mamba. So these packets that are very fun, and the only thing natural in this packet is the dried herb that they dehydrated before they sprayed the abnormal chemical on top of it, which is the thing that's making you high. Okay? So it's actually a, a misnomer. So these problem is that these medications or these chemicals that are created, um, the FDA just can't keep on top of them. So we are seeing that in, um, in um, the brain, they are, they are attacking the same uh, cannabinoid receptors, but in a very different way, very much more mind-altering, and that 
what's happening is the FDA is trying to say, okay, recognize this one, I'm gonna make this one illegal. And then the chemical company just creates a different chemical. So this is one of the big problems that we're having. Is this a national crisis? Well, I would say that like in 2015, we saw this huge spike to the um, Poison Control Center, over 7,000 cases related to synthetic marijuana. It was on the news quite a bit. These people kind of eating people's faces, doing bath salts, and very bizarre kinds of things that were all related to this. Um, we are seeing, luckily, a small drop in the numbers, um, but still 2,000 cases a year being called into the Poison Control Center. So those are the ones we know about being called in. Those are not the ones we don't know about. Um, so big problem. We do know that as the FDA tries to get a hold of it, they are um, classifying them as Schedule One chemicals, but that's not helping because you can see in 2014, the DEA lab actually identified 177 different varieties, and in 2015, 84 new synthetic varieties on the market. So there's no way we can keep up with this from a regulatory standpoint. Um, they are marketed uh, both on the website, so you can go Google this if you're, you know, not maybe not in your work computer, um, but you can go Google this and see that they're actually marketing them as non-detectable. You, you want to get high, but your job doesn't let you use. Buy this instead, and you can get high, and no one will know because the UDS will be negative, right? So they're actually marketed. I know this is kind of hard to see, but it says potpourri, not for in consumption, not for human consumption. That's what the package actually says. Right? And then look, caution, super strong incense with a big like poison sign on the middle of it. But what you're actually supposed to do is either bake it into your brownies and eat it or smoke it. And that's what these kids are doing. All right. So if we look again at our um, past year use from our monitoring the future study. You can see that well, marijuana is way out there, right? Like we talked about high percent use. Synthetic marijuana is the next biggest bump out there of what kids are reporting that they are using in the community, OK? So it is a real risk for us still. Um, I can tell you I do a lot of inpatient medicine, and we are seeing kids come in with really significant problems. They're presenting with a constellation of symptoms, which makes it hard for our ER physicians to try and get their hands around what, what's actually happening. Because I have had kids that have come in in full cardiac arrest from a single use, renal failure going on dialysis, liver failure with LFTs through the roof, and then other kids kind of that vague abdominal pain, vomiting, I don't feel good. OK, do you, do you have the start of the flu? Or did you eat something bad? Because none of them are walking in and saying, well, here's the packet I ingested, right? No, they're not doing that. So the poor ER physicians are trying to piece together this crazy puzzle of how our kids and young adults are presenting to the ER with all these new things that are on the market. So their index of suspicion needs to be really high. But we are really seeing a really significant rise of this. And the newest thing on the market that we're seeing um, out there, or the newest risk that we're seeing out there is significant bleeding. So kids coming in just random bleeding from orifices and stuff. And so significant problems with these chemicals impacting what's actually supposed to be happening in our body. So here's just a couple case reports of that same idea where um, patients are presenting to the ER with chest pain all after K2 use, um, and they were shown to have acute MI. So we, we don't think about acute MIs in our teenagers, right? These are healthy kids. Like heart attacks are not the thing that is like top of your differential for chest pain for kids, right? Or it didn't used to be. When I trained, it was like, ah, uh, you know, you have costochondritis, you, or you coughed really for too long with your head because you're cold, and now your muscles are sore. But now they come in with chest pain, and we're like, have you used anything? Like, what are you doing? What's happening? Okay, talk to me behind your mom's back. I won't tell her, but you got to tell me, did you, did you smoke something? Because you might actually be having a heart attack, and you're 15 and otherwise healthy. That's a problem, right? That's a huge problem for us today in America, right? We're also seeing that chronic use is, again, with them using inhalants. They're getting all those nasty chemicals into their lungs. And so we are seeing pulmonary infiltrates in these kids who are using, and unfortunately, sometimes on their autopsy, seeing really drastic things in their lung exams. So withdrawal, again, I have kids who have used daily coming to me trying to say, like, OK, I'm ready to stop using. What do I do? How do I go about it? But they'll have withdrawal symptoms, just like we can have cannabis um, uh, hyperemesis syndrome, so we're seeing a huge amount of that. Kids that are smoking a lot are coming in. So if you have any family or friends, hopefully not your own family, coming to you saying, man, they're just vomiting, vomiting, vomiting. They can't get over this flu bug, and all they want to do is take a hot shower, that is not the flu. 
that is hyperemesis from cannabinoid. So when you guys have this high dose of THC, what they want, the only thing that relieves them, the only way they feel better is hot, hot showers. We just like literally admit them because they need IV fluids so they can't keep anything down and we just let them stand in the shower. And they just stand in the shower until they essentially decompress and get rid of the, the meds out of their body because there's nothing else we can do except support them. So when you see that, that's a problem. But as they come off chronic use, they also can have anxiety. If they were using it for euphoria, if they felt their life was horrible, if they felt like they were being bullied, and now they're not using, what are we doing to give them coping skills? How are we getting them into therapy? We have a drastic shortage of pediatric and adolescent psychologists that can do therapy for us. Right now, we need that. Our kids are suffering here in America. They have a lot on their plate, and we need to normalize going to therapy. It's OK to need therapy. I sent both my kids to therapy. They're like, why do I have to go to therapy? I'm, we're like, all right. And I was like, therapy is good for everybody. You go. You talk about this with somebody, because I hope you can talk about it with me. But you know what? Maybe you don't yet feel comfortable, right? So you're going to go to therapy and talk about it with that, that, that person. And at, now that they're a little older, they're like, yeah, that, that was actually really good. That was good. But we still haven't fully normalized this. Kids are still like, I'm not crazy. I don't need to go to therapy. What is that all about, right? We need to fix that because we need to give them other coping skills, other ways to be healthy than using substances, right? So <laughs> unfortunately, uh, for our poor police department, they're also encountering crazy behavior. People stripping off their clothes and acting like animals, running through the streets. So with the use of these synthetics, um, because of the way that they're mind altering, they're having hallucinations and believe that people are talking to them, believe that they're not human. And so we're seeing um, rises of this case, these cases. What about vaping? So this is our last topic for today. We're going to talk about e-cigarettes. So according to the CDC, the number of middle and high school students using e-cigarettes rose in just a single year from 2017 to 2018 over 1.5 million users. So now looking at 3.6 million children and adolescents report using e-cigarettes in 2018. It's a staggering number, right? It's, a, it's huge. One in every five high school students reported that they used them in the last 30 days. It's an increase from 2011 of only 1.5%. So if we keep on this trajectory, 1.5%, and in seven years we went to 20%, in seven years, where are we going to be? What do our kids think? Why do they think this is safe? Well, because they're flavored like cotton candy and jelly bean and all these great names, and they're going to tell you they're not marketing to children. So the laws did come out last year to make them start changing some of that perception. Um, there was actually part of the um, study that they looked at what do kids think they're vaping when they're vaping, and some of them think they're vaping nicotine, some of them think they're vaping marijuana, but a good percentage of them think they're only vaping flavor when oftentimes that flavor is actually combined with other chemicals, either nicotine, THC, or other chemicals. So in this, the samples that people have taken to look at, there are trace heavy metals. Do we want any of us smoking trace heavy metals? I mean, I don't know what's a safe level of trace heavy metals after watching Aaron Brockovich's, but like, I don't want any trace heavy metals, and I don't want my kid having any trace heavy metals that aren't for specific reasons, right, that we can say have been medically sounded. So you'll notice that here on the bottom is this picture of a jewel. Uh, again, I'm not picking on jewel. There's tons of different mark those brands out there, um, but this one particularly looks sort of like a little uh, a USB drive, very thin and small, could be easily hid in your pocket, in your hand. Um, but this black end is the pod. So the little black end is the pod that gets replaced and removed. And you put the, the kind of the gold end in their mouth and suck. And each one of those pods has about 20 cigarettes worth of nicotine in each pod. So how quickly they puff through that. Um, it's marketed as like you don't have to smell like cigarettes anymore. So you can, you can use your nicotine safely in the workplace and in your home without feeling ostracized. And, you know, and there might be some validity in that for adults who are trying to get off tobacco and maybe using one of these to transition off. I'll let our family medicine and internal medicine people speak about that. But in kids, this is not OK. All right, This is not safe. So here we are in 2017 and 2018. This blue bar is our amount of nicotine use uh, via vaping that our kids in the eighth grade said. And then in 2018, 
And then in 2017 is marijuana use in the green bars, and in the orange bars, marijuana use in 2018. And across every domain, 8th graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders, you see, you see from 2017 to 2018 the sharp rise in the percentage of kids using either intentionally nicotine or intentionally marijuana via a vaping device because it's, their parents can't tell, right? You don't know, they can't smell the joint. It's just inhaled through this. So it's really important that we pay attention to what this, cri this crisis that we're calling stealth vaping. They're made fun pens. I mean, look, Hello Kitty in fun colors. Who doesn't love Hello Kitty, right? I mean, it's awesome. And here on the bottom, some of the other methods that we see. Um, and so this is really creating a problem. In the news, just about a month or so ago, there was a young man, 24 years old, who lost his life because his vape pen exploded as he went to light it and actually exploded with such force that it shot the piece of metal out of the vape pen, through his neck, into his carotid artery, and he bled out in the parking lot of the vape store where he had gone to purchase his vaping. So I'm not saying, OK, every one of our kids is going to get their carotid artery severed by their vape pen, but this is a real risk. Our kids are not having the money to buy the most expensive, most reliable vape pens on the market. right? They're getting the cheapest thing they can find. The cheapest thing they can find is not necessarily the one that is made to last. The one that, when it gets heated up, might actually explode on them and create problems. So we're seeing a rise of these vape explosions in the media. And probably my least favorite, this is the stealth puffet. So this uh, article, um, I pulled this quote out of an article um, from The Cannabis in August 2017. They have created a puffer um, for vaping that looks like your albuterol inhaler. And the thought is, well, here you go. Here's the quote, which is why I love the idea of a vaporizer that imitates an asthma inhaler. The Puffet vaporizer, designed for discretion, and public tokers should have reason to rejoice. What insensitive jerk is going to question your inhaler use in public? I mean, it's called HIPAA. Look it up. So they are intentionally marketing to kids to use methods that would otherwise be a way that we would be able to say, let's reach out to that kid. Let's recognize there's a problem. But in this way, we wouldn't necessarily know that. So a big national crisis for me as a pediatrician, we really need to wrap our head, hands and heads around this problem, tell these kids that we love them, but there are other safer coping mechanisms than using, and let's figure out together how we can approach these children and get them the therapy they need. There are some resources. If you have fam family or friends that need help, there are both national and regional resources for use. Please reach out. Um, it, you are not alone, and we want to make sure that you get what you need. Here are my references, and I welcome in the last couple minutes uh, so we don't run over for the next presenter any questions. Thank you, Aleka. Yeah. We have time for a couple of questions. Here's a question. Uh, and uh, even though psychotics are probably self-selecting for marijuana use, right. do we want our kids hanging out with psychotics? Right, so I think that's true. And so there's a lot of that debate, like are we using because we have a predisposition to using, because we have more anxiety states, because we have more challenges, or is the use itself also causing us to have more anxiety states and more psychosis? And I think there's probably some mix of both. Um, but we definitely know by the research that marijuana impacts the growing and developing brain, and by doing that, it's exacerbating probably previously predisposed regions and causing a further risk. Our cute little boxes aren't working. Shout it out and I'll replace, I'll repeat the question. My question is regarding motivation. Yeah. Um, how do you motivate those kids to stay off of vaping and, and marijuana for vaping? I don't know if I have a good way of, of really motivating them to, to do that. And many times with adolescents, it doesn't go to what using marijuana. They're not really thinking about how smart they're going to be. Nope. They don't care about that stuff. I'm more of that I use is, hey, look, man, if they're a guy, I say, look, it's going to show they can decrease your testicular size. Yeah. Oh. And you, you want your balls to be smaller? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, right. I'm curious, how, how, how do you motivate kids yeah. regarding marijuana? Yeah, so the question for those of you can hear or those of you that are watching is um, how do we motivate our kids to not vape or use marijuana um, in this adolescent brain of they, they don't think long term. They don't think, well, I'm pro and they also never think it's going to happen to them, 
right? They're never going to be the one that crashes their car and kills their brother. They're never going to be the one that gets somebody pregnant. It's not them, right? And so that's why it's really important in adolescents, particularly if you see a lot of uh, adolescents in your population or kids, get yourself better versed with motivational interviewing. It takes many visits and repeated visits to bring them back to get them to the point where they recognize the risk to them. And it cannot be from us just telling them. It has to be using these motivational techniques of saying, like, what's meaningful to you? Do you, when you're, I always say, when you're old like me, do you want a job? Yeah. Okay, do you want to pick that job or do you want someone to pick it for you? Like, do you want your testicles to be small? Do you want to have man breasts? Right? Like, what's important to you? So let's talk about that. And then because they giggle, you, you have to align with them, right? You have to, they have to see you as someone who has their best interest at heart before you go on to that harder topic of, let's talk about maybe why this is not a good choice for you. Because if you're just seen as another adult parent who's like waving their finger at them, you've lost them. You've lost them. So I strongly recommend if you've not done um, any real training in motivational interviewing, that you take the effort to do that because it really does help the way you approach these kids. We have time for one more question. Thank you very much for this uh, well-prepared uh, appeal. Now we need to take this out to the schools. We're from Oregon. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our town, as a result of our speaking to the local town leaders, voted no stores in our whole town, which That's is unique in our state. That's amazing. But, but we need to take it to the schools. Now, do you have a, a handout or some way we can access a well-prepared presentation without spending weeks and weeks putting it all together from the internet uh, that could help us in that? Sure. So I will, I'm happy for, to share this. You may freely use it. Um, nothing I have in here is protected. All the NIH stuff is freely usable. Um, so I am happy for you to take this canned presentation, modify anything you want and present it. Is, I need advocates like you out there. Thank you so much for doing that. We need to really get our hands around this. And it's going to take us grassroots. We have to get into the schools. We have to get to our local politicians. Because you know what? Last year, in 2018, the, the California alone is predicting about 300,000 in medical marijuana sales, but $1.3 billion in adult use sales. And they're predicting that to be over $7 billion by 2020. So the financial likelihood of them wanting to quit selling and using is not very high. So we need them to understand the risk for our children. But in, so, in Oregon, the price has just dropped way out because it's so abundant now that the supply and demand, a lot of these farms are, are losing their shirt with their investment. And I'm thankful to say. <laughs> yeah. the, Although now people can grow them themselves. These slides actually are available on the website, the Alumni Association website. Round of applause. Thank you so Great. much. That was tremendous. Now we know why Dr. Clark won all of those teaching awards. And thank you, by the way, for your service and keeping our young ones safe and healthy.